All right, guys, so today is the day that everybody is allowed to start talking about the performance about AMD's Ryzen 7000 X 3D series. So more specifically, this one it is the one that I'm going to be focusing on today, the 7950 X 3D. But I wanted to do things completely differently because I know that there's a ton of benchmarks out there and you're gonna see some benchmarks in this video. But at the same time, I really wanted to focus in on how the numbers that you're seeing right now are actually achieved. So basically, what kind of cooling do you need to hit the numbers that you are seeing in every single one of the reviews right now? So basically, do you need to optimize your cooling with a high, high-end cooling solution in order for this to hit the best performance possible? Or is the X3D able to be cooled with something a little bit more basic? The 7950X3D is actually slower than the 7950X in the one area where you would actually need a chip with 32 threads. And that's in rendering apps that focus solely on leveraging this chip's huge number of cores. This doesn't really look like a good start though, considering you can buy a 7950X these days for under 600 bucks and with a free game too. Meanwhile, this X3D will go for about $700 on launch. And yet the 7950X3D's actual strength is of course in gaming, provided you wanna use your $700 chip to play at 1080p. In that case, it's good, really good actually a couple of times, but there's no way in hell you should be buying a 16 core chip for gaming. Anyways, now that you actually know how this thing performs and you still might want a 7900X3D or 7950X3D, what we need to discuss here is it seems like AMD has created the perfect storm to absolutely demolish every single CPU cooler on the market. On one hand, you have an architecture that by design tries to reach a thermal limit and outputs a lot of heat to get there. It's then coupled with an IHS design that tends to hinder cooling to the point where you can throw a metric ton of heat sink capacity at one of these chips without any noticeable temperature reduction. Then on top of that, AMD is now adding 3D vCache, which technically could make things even worse. And look, I've already covered pretty much everything there is to know about the Ryzen 7000 series, clock speeds and temperatures and how those two things affect performance in a bunch of videos. I'm gonna leave links to those in the description down below because they are almost essential viewing before you watch this video because it really sets the stage about how these chips behave. But the X3D, it does things a little bit differently. Because to compensate for that 3D vCache, there's been a few fundamental changes to the X3D models that should make them behave quite differently. Take the 7950X3D for example. Its default TDPs have been reduced by a whole 50 watts, which means a 300 megahertz lower cap to its base clock. But the big deal here is actually the six degree decrease in TJ Maxx. All right, so I guess now you understand what is going on on paper to achieve those performance numbers that we saw at the beginning of this video. But what I wanted to do is of course, really dive into how the 7950X3D performs and behaves against the 7950X when it comes to things like temperatures and clock speeds, and of course, overall power consumption. And what you're about to see is gonna be a best case full core workload scenario, along with Deepcool's LT720, a 360 millimeter AIO running at absolutely full tilt to see what happens when these CPUs are given the maximum amount of thermal headroom to stretch their legs. Let's start off with the obvious. TDP numbers don't equate actual power consumption. And the 7950X has proven that by sucking back 217 watts over the 10 minute test. But there's a night and day difference with the X3D since it needs just 143 watts to get through the exact same blender workload. That huge delta in power between the two chips leads to temperature drops too, with the 7950X striving to hit its 95 degree T-junction, and the 7950X3D, well, check this out. It's running along at a constant 73 degrees, which is an absolutely massive reduction. Though when you add clock speeds to this, things really start to get interesting. 
the 7950X runs along at about 5.1 gigahertz. The X3D on the other hand, well, it's 75 watts of power savings and 22 degrees of aggregate temperature reduction leads to a cut of just, yep, 215 megahertz. That's it. And let that sink in for a second. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because for the X3D, I would actually argue that full core workloads don't even really matter. This is of course a gaming CPU and I hope anybody buying this will be using it most exclusively for gaming. But that also means that we need to shift gears here. So what I wanted to do is run the exact same test that we did before. So basically the LT720 running at 100% fan and pump speed, but now focus on gaming. So Doom Eternal along with an RTX 4090 running at 1080p. So the first thing I wanted to add here are the wattage from both CPUs when running the blender load. Now compare that to where the 7950X sits in gaming, just 116 watts right across the board. But that's nothing compared to the X3D, which needs around 90 watts in the same situation, while remember, also performing better. Temperatures in gaming follow that same trend too, when we first put the full core load results here and then see where the 7950X ultimately landed at just 60 degrees, give or take. Meanwhile, the 7950X 3D lands even lower, reaching a constant 52 degrees with peaks of at most 56 degrees. And I know a lot of people were having literal meltdowns over the Ryzen 7000 series' temperatures, but if it's gaming you care about, it was a big fat nothing burger. The fact of the matter is if they're being used for gaming, these new Ryzen CPUs are efficient and run pretty cool too. So that was the absolute best case scenario. So a 360 millimeter AIO running at full chooch factor. But if you've seen these videos in the past, you know that we are nowhere near done yet because the entire intent here is to see how this chip performs across a wide variety of cooling solutions. So let's actually see what we're gonna be using here. Anyways, the cheapest of the bunch is the AG400 BK ARGB, which is basically a cooler that plays at the upper end of the entry level market. It's got a 120 millimeter fan, a relatively compact fin array, and an HDT base, which is common for its price point. On the other hand, the AG500 steps things up a bit. It's got the same 120 millimeter ARGB fan from the 400, but comes with a much wider side profile that houses five heat pipes all terminating into an HDT base. That additional cooling mass puts it in a completely different category than the lower end coolers. And it's a perfect representation of what you can expect from a mid-tier $40 heatsink. The big boy on the air cooling side is the AG620, which is essentially a clone of one of the best coolers I've reviewed, the AK620. The only difference are the two ARGB fans and the AG cooler has none of the plastic bits that give the AK series its distinctively clean look, so it gets a price cut of about 10 bucks. The AIOs, on the other hand, are the 240 millimeter LT520 and the 360 millimeter LT720. Both ditch the RGB fans from other versions and laser focus on performance by being equipped with higher static pressure fans. And in the results coming up, you'll see that all of these coolers were tested at 100% and 50% fan speed to give you a rough idea of how they can perform at their absolute best and how things shake out when noise reduction is more of a priority. I should also mention that like usual with a lot of these temperature testing videos, all of the results that you see are done in a closed Meshify C case with all of the interior case fans running at 1000 RPM, along with an ambient room temperature of about 22 degrees. And the most important thing to kick this off with is power needs for the games we tested. There's Doom, which hits 90 watts and peaks around 95 watts. Meanwhile, F1 2022, your typical racing game, hit within the 80s. Cyberpunk 2077 was a bit of a surprise, since of the 20 or so games we tested for this video, it actually guzzled back the most power, with peaks hovering just north of 100 watts. City Skylines was actually a surprise too, since everyone keeps saying it's a CPU hog. But based on power needs alone, 
it actually isn't. Anyways, starting with F1 2022, and all these coolers are able to keep temperatures below 65 degrees. And yeah, that even goes for the AG400 running at just 50% fan speed. There is a pretty big 13 degree delta here though. And yet it doesn't lead to one iota of additional performance with every single cooling solution here getting identical frame rates, or at least identical to the point where the differences are well within our margin of error. Doom tends to be on the upper end of the CPU power spectrum, but the temperatures here are still amazing right across the board. You'll also notice that the lower end heat sinks are a few degrees hotter than the last test. With that being said, no matter how many times we check this, for whatever reason, the LT720 does seem to have a small, almost infinitesimal lead over the other heatsinks here. But still, you can easily get away with running any of these coolers at just 50% fan speed without sacrificing frame rates whatsoever. Cyberpunk, well, we already know that this is the most power hungry game here. And that shows here with the coolers hitting temperatures that are a good seven to 10 degrees higher than they did in the other games. But again, even that didn't push the coolers beyond 75 degrees. And there wasn't really any notable deviation in frame rates from one cooler to the next either. At least none that lead me to think temperatures are a factor at least. Remember, if you're playing above 1080p or with a lower end GPU than our 4090, CPU usage will be even lower, so temperatures should be even more manageable. And I wanted to take a little bit of a detour here to talk about, yes, cities, Skylines, because I listen, you guys, everybody's been saying you have got to include this in temperature testing for all of your cooler, your fan videos, everything else. And at first glance, those power consumption numbers that you saw before completely had me thinking everybody was absolutely crazy. But then, then we looked at the temperatures. This game actually has the CPU sipping back power, but it does throw out almost as much heat as Cyberpunk. Why? Well, the way City Skylines seems to hit the 7950X3D's cores and CCX complexes is completely different than the other titles we're testing here. Even that doesn't affect overall performance, since everything here behaved pretty much identically. Even on such a high-end system though, performance isn't great. But hey, that's what you get in City Skylines with all the bangs and whistles turned on as your population hits above 300k. So that's gaming, and obviously the 7950X3D is super easy to manage regardless of whatever cooling solution you have, from the high end to the entry level. Not like you're gonna wanna have that entry level cooling solution for a $700 CPU, but even when you take that into account, it is a heck of a lot easier to manage than pretty much anything else in AMD's Ryzen 7000 series lineup to date. That includes the 7900X, 7800X, and in some cases, even the 7600X. But anyways, to wrap all of this up, I wanted to sort of circle back and talk about full core load performance too. And things tend to turn on their head a bit here, with the two AIOs getting under 80 degrees, but there's a pretty big gap between those and the best air coolers. The AG620 needs 100% fan speed to hit 80 degrees, and so does the AG500. By the time we hit the AG400 at 50% fan speed, the X3D is starting to get a bit toasty at 80 degrees, or right on the nose of AMD's TJ Maxx. And that does lead to a slight reduction in overall clock speeds for the AG500 and AG400 when running at their lowest fan speed settings in our tests. Otherwise, every cooler managed to stick above 4.8 gigahertz. And in the grand scheme of things, even such a large temperature delta and resulting clock speed variance leads to a super small offset in raw performance. I mean, we're talking about just 24 seconds across a 12 minute render from the best cooler here to the worst. So I guess that pretty much wraps things up. And I think to me, as well as you guys, a lot of these results came as a pleasant surprise. But would I personally buy a 7950 X3D. It might run super cool, but I actually would not. I would actually wait right now. Instead of buying the $700 CPU, I would wait for the 7800 X3D and see where that ends up landing. 
Ultimately though, this 7950X3D can get better gaming performance than the 7950X while needing less power and outputting way, way less heat. That means you can run your cooler at much lower noise levels and even get amazing temperatures with more affordable cooling solutions. And for a gaming focused CPU, those are some extremely important selling points. Anyways, I really hope that you guys enjoyed this content. I know it's a little bit different for a launch day video, but heck, sometimes you just need to try something different. If you like this, please let us know in the comments below. I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks and I will definitely see you in the next one. Take care guys.